This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the absolute best platform for your website. So Tatsuki Fujimoto just released a brand new manga, Goodbye Eri, and while I know many fans of Fujimoto have been eagerly anticipating the continuation of his hit manga Chainsaw Man, this new one-shot is so much more than just something to bide the time until then. It's a story deeply expressing Fujimoto's love for film, with themes of perspective and preservation, with a unique visual language. Being a story about a movie, or rather a story that is a movie and portrayed to the readers as such, blurring the lines between manga and film as when reading you become immersed in its pacing and clever paneling, which is only just the foundation for its characters and story to strive, as we follow the perspective of the young boy Yuta's home movie, filming his ill mother and soon-to-be friend Eri in their final days, with just a pinch of fantasy. So today, we'll be breaking down how Goodbye Eri succeeds in its ambition of being a cinematic manga, and all of the genius techniques and writing Fujimoto crafted into this work to make it the best manga I've read all year. So to start, we first need to look at this manga's aforementioned visual language before any of the writing or characters, as this entire manga is portrayed in a film-esque manner through its unique use of paneling, as nearly the entire one-shot is comprised of the same exact page layout, four rectangles in succession, which act as the screen to show the footage being recorded by our main character Yuta, as if each panel were a single frame of a scrolling film reel. This restriction and repetition of seeing through the camera's point of view keeps the reader immersed in the film, as although you're reading a manga, the consistency of the panels and the subtle movements of characters in between frames brings the pages to life. And more so than many other manga, as entire pages are often dedicated to a single change in facial expressions, or a simple adversion of attention, leaving little room for us needing to fill in the blanks. We can also feel the weight of this camera in Yuta's hands, which further sells the idea that we are watching a film, with panels out of focus, off-centered, and movements invoking certain emotions, like when Yuta is running up the hospital stairwell, fully committed to ending his life. We can't see Yuta's face if there are tears or a smile we only see through his camera, recklessly swinging as he runs to the roof, conveying the rage and embarrassment he feels. There's also a very clever use of a digital blur effect applied to many panels, which imitates the motion blur of camera movement and refocusing. And all of these subtle details coalesce into an almost subconscious experience in creating a visually distinct manga, which ironically simplifies the capabilities of its medium by using a repetitive panel layout and many reused backgrounds, but deliberately so to invoke a more cinematic tone. So now for the actual content of the story, starting with the cover page, as we are first introduced to Yuta's perspective, looking at life through his camera, followed by us being thrown into the beginning of his first movie. We see Yuta's mom and dad chucking up peace signs, which we'll see becomes an important motif throughout the story. It's Yuta's 12th birthday, and he just got his first smartphone. He's immediately drawn to the camera feature and begins recording, as he swings the camera around with the exact amount of finesse you'd expect from a child. Yuta's first film is a rather depressing story, as shortly after receiving his camera, his mother asks him to record her as much as possible until she dies from her terminal illness. She wants Yuta to be able to remember her, the way she moved, spoke, and the things they did together. A seemingly thoughtful request as Yuta may appreciate the footage someday and be able to remember his mother, although mostly unaware of her request's traumatic implications, asking a child to film the death of his mother. His first film is messy and everything you'd expect from a child who just got a smartphone, with footage often being blurry, recording people trying to use the bathroom, and often distracted by strange cats and insects dying on the street, although the disarray of footage thrown together is an accurate representation of Yuta's emotions. He's losing his mother, he's angry and unable to even realize what's happening or how to feel. I'm keeping watch in case she dies in her sleep. Dad's crying. This is my face now. And by the end of the film, Yuta is at the hospital, being expected to film his mother's dying breath, but suddenly runs away from the hospital as it explodes behind him, screaming goodbye, mother, thus concluding Yuta's first documentary, subtly titled Dead Explosion Mother, revealing to the readers that this manga is not a first-person narrative, it twists the perspective, which it does multiple times throughout the entire story. Rather, we've been watching Yuta's movie this whole time, and we're actually seeing through his perspective, only what he wanted to show in his film, which was also being screened to his entire school as some sort of project. This special effect twist explosion ending left the audience mortified, followed by laughter ridiculing the film for how bad it was. Yuta's friends were appalled by the disrespect he had shown towards his mother in this movie, questioning his sense of morals and even calling him despicable. So why did Yuta add this explosion to his film? He claimed it was awesome and thought movies needed explosions, speaking to his immaturity, although when applying the context we learn later in the manga, it begins to make more sense why Yuta would do such a thing. It's later revealed that 
that Yuta's mother was not the kind and brave person she portrayed in his film. In fact, she was abusive and manipulative of Yuta, using her TV production background to direct Yuta into making a film that wasn't for him to remember his mother, rather a film all about her and her fight against her illness, that she could later produce after recovering, or at least that was the plan. We see unused footage of Yuta's mother berating and physically abusing him for not filming correctly or doing a quote unquote bad job, which recontextualizes Yuta's first film as not time well spent with his dying mother, but as a stressful and emotionally difficult chore. Being used as a tool by his mother for her own greed of a hypothetical successful documentary starring her. And never once did she let go of this malice and selfishness, calling her own son useless to the very end. And this behavior may seem reminiscent of another one of Fujimoto's characters, Makima, as Makima and Yuta's mothers actually have very similar designs, which may have been intentional, foreshadowing that she isn't who she seems, something that readers of Chainsaw Man would have picked up on. So does this new perspective explain why Yuta would disrespect his mother's death with the explosion? Is it a symbol of his lingering animosity, a representation of built up emotions, or simple immaturity? I see this as Yuta's refusal to accept the reality of his situation, as it's easier to ignore something if it's fixed. So instead of putting on screen his mother's dying breath and accepting the reality of her passing, he chose to use the film as a means to alter his reality, hide the way she really treated him, and choose to remember only the good parts of his mother, and in the end, unwilling to accept her death by making the entire story a work of fiction. Using the explosion as a sort of subconscious coping mechanism to deny that this movie was in many ways his reality. So although Dead Mother Explosion was a flop, it wasn't all bad, and shows us that Yuta has a passion for filmmaking, but just needed more experience, and after the way the audience reacted to that ending, he mostly needed redemption. And this leads us to the titular character Eri, a student who had seen Yuta's first film and realized his talents for filmmaking, and gave him the opportunity for that redemption, a second shot at making a movie, and a second shot at life as she was the one who prevented Yuta's suicide attempt after the embarrassment he felt from that first screening. The second half of the one shot is primarily focused on Yuta's time spent with Eri, a girl sharing her passion for movies with Yuta, spending their days in an abandoned building, watching movie after movie to build Yuta's experience in both cinematography and human connection. These scenes are quite reminiscent of Chainsaw Man's iconic chapter 39, Tearjerker, where Denji and Makima go to the cinemas and she teaches him the importance of movies. In fact, Yuta and Eri's entire relationship is reminiscent of typical Fujimoto character dynamics, with women being placed in a higher position than the male protagonist, offering them purpose and guidance through the story, often through the use of a femme fatale archetype. Although Eri, while less malicious than say Makima, still fulfills a similar role. She sees the potential within Yuta and offers her life to make his new film, under the fantasy that Eri is this femme fatale vampire who uses Yuta to make a film about her fictional death so she's not forgotten. Although if when reading this you couldn't see it coming from a mile away, this fiction soon becomes reality as we learn Eri is also suffering from a terminal illness like Yuta's mother and is slowly approaching her final days. Yuta is once again asked to capture the final moments of someone he cares about, but this time with the guidance and encouragement of Eri to finally make his comeback movie. It's a heartbreaking progression seeing Yuta and Eri's days pass, as they watch, eat, travel, explore, and just spend time together. They even pick up on each other's movie watching habits, having seen hundreds of films together, pointing things out that they didn't even know about themselves. Like how Eri will always make a subtle peace sign when characters score a big win, and how Yuta will involuntarily whisper aw yeah every time he sees a pair of tits on screen. But eventually time catches up with the two and Eri approaches her final days, and it's now Yuta's responsibility to redeem himself and not ignore his reality with another exploding hospital, but to be with Eri recording her final moments, and make a movie that will make them all bawl their eyes out. Which absolutely does, as at the end of Yuta's second screening, the audience is hit by a wave of emotions, followed by only the sobbing of classmates, as Yuta chucks up a victorious peace sign in memory of Eri, as he just scored a big win. Although by the end of it all, an Eri is gone, and we're hit by four entire pages of black panels giving us that lonely feeling after finishing a movie left only with our thoughts as the credits roll, it was still missing something. Something that takes Yuta decades to find, as the final act of this manga is a sort of post-credit epilogue, where we skip into the future and we see an adult Yuta, who even after all of this time, is still re-editing and working on Eri's film. And as if this story wasn't already sad enough from Yuta's childhood, we skip to the lowest point in his life as an adult, where he's just recovering from an accident that took his entire family, and he chooses to end his life in the place that holds many memories to him, the abandoned building, showing that he never really got proper closure to Aerie's death. And as Yuta walks through that door, 
he's not alone anymore. Because surprise, Eri is still there, watching movies even after all of this time. Because of course she is. She's a 1200 year old vampire, who used Yuta's film to hold on to her memories, giving Yuta's movie its pinch of fantasy, and Yuta a final goodbye to Eri. As Yuta's film finally found what it was missing, as well as he got proper closure to Eri, as he walks away from the abandoned building, erupting into an explosion. So what the hell does it all mean? Is Eri really a vampire, and why are buildings exploding again? The explosion is of course a Yuta signature technique, even his father said that's what his movies were known for, explosions. But this explosion is the single motif that fully ties this manga together, and gives the final reveal that everything, the whole manga, from page 1 to 200, was Yuta's final movie, his final cut of Goodbye Eerie, and not a single panel was us experiencing these characters from outside of the camera, or at least that's one interpretation. And that's the beauty of this story and brings it even closer to the world of film, leaving the viewers with multiple interpretations. Was this actually Eerie at the building, and is she a 1200 year old vampire? Or maybe when adult Yuta entered that abandoned building, he finally found closure to his relationship with Eerie and his film, realizing what it was missing and inspiring this fictional idea ending of Eerie returning as a vampire? Or was Yuta even an adult here, and did it actually take him decades to finish the movie? Or maybe this ending was actually Eri's idea before her death, and they used Yuta's father to play the role as an adult Yuta, recording this final scene sometime before she died. And it's all of these possibilities and interpretations that make for a perfect ending to Fujimoto's movie manga, as it can forever be discussed and debated in the same fashion as so many classic movies, with a final scene that leaves viewers with the question, what's real and what's the truth, a question the story itself will never answer. Rather, it's left for you, the reader, to decide. But what is real is Squarespace, and it gives people a powerful online platform to create their own personalized website with easy to use and intuitive design tools to connect everything that matters to you in one website. All of your content and social media accessible in one place. Host an online store to sell products that's easy to set up and manage with Squarespace extensions, offering tools to manage inventory, bookkeeping, and advertising. Use your website to connect with your audience through powerful blogging tools that have fully integrated threaded comments and replies that can be categorized and scheduled for your convenience. And with those same tools, you can generate revenue through your site by offering exclusive member-only content. And for those that wish to participate, you can manage members and even have email campaigns. And all of it in one easy-to-use platform. And best of all, you can try out all of these features and more for free at squarespace.com. And you only need to pay when you're ready to publish your website. And when you're ready to go, go to squarespace.com exports to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.